everyone and welcome to our SESI Talks. Uh, today we're here again with uh, Mr. Pesaro, who has been very, very kind to join us again for this second round of SESI Talks. Obviously, SESI Talks is part of the uh, pro European project we EP, so workers and the European Parliament. So I'm going to ask the question right away to you. Uh, what is the EU done so far to protect workers and their rights, and especially during the pandemic? What changes have there been since our last conversation that has been in April? Well, thank you very much for your kind invitation. I think that uh, all of us can agree that despite its limited competences in the field of employment and social protection, the EU has a history of legislative acts that effectively improved working conditions. It is true that in some occasions, like in the aftermath of the international crisis in 2008, EU policies have also been detrimental to labour rights. I'm thinking about the austerity measures dictated and imposed to some countries, like my own country, Portugal. I would say that in the past we have seen contradiction between legislative acts and economic and budgetary orientations. As regards to the pandemic, we must, we must distinguish between emergency measures and recovery measures. In the former, I will single out the SURE mechanism, which supported the Member States in coping with the layoff uh, expenditure. It was very important to fight against unemployment. I would also underline the very successful vaccination process organized at the EU level, which paved the way for economic normalization and thus for the safeguarding of millions of jobs. Then we have the recovery measures reflected in the national recovery plans, with a strong focus on the creation of quality jobs in the context of the twin transition, the implementation of the RRF F, and the, in particular the investment and reforms in green and digital have a great potential for job creation and, to, and for reduction of inequalities. Let us not forget that the social dimension in the reforms has to comply with the social objectives in the RRF regulation, which include the protection of workers' rights, amongst others. But we have to bear in mind the, that the impact of the pandemic on labor markets will last for this, the years ahead. Last but not the least, we have the Porto Social Summit in May and the endorsement of the European Social uh, the Pillar uh, Action Plan with uh, new indicators in the social scoreboard for the European semester, new directives on the adequate uh, the minimum income, on pay transparency and on, and on platform workers among other very positive measures. So, answering directly to your question, Sarah, Thank uh, you. much has changed since April and changed for the better. Absolutely, and we hope that it's going to continue to be so. And uh, as an MEP, you're also part of the Committee on Employment and Social Affairs. And uh, obviously, connected to your, to your answers just now, uh, we know that the um, the problems that the pandemic has caused are going to last for a long time. We are approaching them, uh, but we also have to make sure that all sectors, are, are all workers sort of do not get discriminated. So have you analyzed which sectors of type of employment have been hit the most by the pandem pandemic and how can we mitigate the consequences in order not to create discrimination or in order for nobody to be left behind? Yes, this is a very important question because the impacts are, of course, quite asymmetric. They are different from sector to sector. The cross-border and posted workers were hit very hard by travel restrictions, of course. Overall, precarious jobs or jobs with less robust employment relationships were further penalized. Workers whose income depends on events and performance. I'm thinking mostly about the artists and cultural workers which were already severely affected by job insecurity before the pandemic or very much affected in the pandemic. In general, activities relying on indoor public gatherings. Uh, then we have the labor force responsible for basic services, such as cleaning, transports, food retailing, health sector, low paid in a lot of cases, and in some cases, particularly exposed to the COVID-19 risks. 
what we need is to build a robust legislative framework to protect the workers who are presently unprotected. Then we have new realities like teleworking that demand urgent regulation. Teleworking has brought about new problems related to work-life balance and physical and mental well-being at work, which must be tackled and are currently being discussed at the EU level, EU level including in the European Parliament. I believe that in the future, EU funding should grow to cash on national social welfare systems in times of crisis. We need a more socially resilient EU for everybody. Absolutely. And uh, also, you are a part of the Committee uh, for Fisheries, uh, specifically yes. to this sector. So what is the European Union doing for the employment of coastal communities and how can we attract new workers for the fishing industry? This is a very serious question because uh, I have made a, a, a non-initiative report about fishers for the future and uh, we must uh, know that uh, we have uh, a very low capacity to attract young people to this kind to this activity so important for uh, coastal communities and for all the Europeans. In terms of concrete actions, the new European Maritime Fisheries and Aquaculture Fund, uh, so-called EMFAF, introduced two measures that I believe that are important for attracting new generations to the fisheries sector. First were created special conditions supporting young fishers up to 40 years of age to purchase second-hand fishing vessels. In this way, support is guaranteed for young people who want to enter the activity without this leading to an increase in current fishing fleet capacity. Financing conditions were also created for improving safety, habitability and work conditions aboard, which increased the gross tonnage of vessels without increasing the capacity to catch fish. This change solves problems identified by the sector and will not increase this uh, and uh, will not only increase the safety and comfort on of work spaces but also create conditions that allow the boats to adapt to receive more female fishers to work on boats. Despite these developments I believe that there is still more to be done particularly in terms of simplifying the recognition of competences between member states and creating cross-cutting curricula so that the training and requirement levels of each function on board are matched. On one of the fundamental rights of European citizens is to be able to work in any member state in a simple way, but the process of recognizing the skills and training for fishers is still a bureaucratic labyrinth and the Union has a duty to find practical and simple solutions. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Pixaro. We have a lot of faith in Europe and we hope we're going to be more united in the future. And obviously to, to be resilient is very important in this period in time and to make sure that we actually get out of, the, of COVID-19 maybe stronger than before. Thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure. Thank you. I think that we should believe together that it is with more Europe that we are going to solve our questions. It's not uh, from the with less Europe that we are not going to to. to we we be cannot able fight to this battle alone. alone. Well, thank you very much. Good thank morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.